Okay, how's it going everybody? I hope you're all doing well. Okay, well so in this episode I thought I'd try to say something about Nietzsche and his view on happiness and its connection to, to meaning and suffering. Okay, so let's just jump right into it. Okay, so let's start with a very famous criticism that Nietzsche makes. What he does is he famously criticizes the English utilitarians. Like, for example, Jeremy Bentham, for advocating a view of happiness that's all about simple pleasure and comfort. Nietzsche's well-known satirizing quote here is this. It's, man does not strive for pleasure, only the Englishman does. In other words, what he's really insinuating, of course, is that humanity's true end shouldn't be happiness conceived of as pleasure. That's to say... Our aim in life should be something much more than some kind of safe, superficial form of satisfaction. Or as Nietzsche says, it should be more than a green pasture happiness. Actually, Bentham's not his only target in this regard. Among others, he also criticizes the Greek philosopher and hedonist Epicurus. Someone, by the way, who was unique as a hedonist in taking the goal of life to be happiness conceived of as, well, as a kind of tranquility or peace of mind. Now, what Nietzsche does is he calls Epicurus's happiness here the happiness of the sickly. In other words, he sees in Epicurus's emphasis on peace of mind someone who suffers from the impoverishment of life, and so someone who seeks uh, rest. This is a person, says Nietzsche, who's weak and unable to engage vigorously with the world. Ultimately, Nietzsche associates Epicurus and his view with a kind of decadence. Okay, so I mention all this to show that well, that basically Nietzsche's got a bit of an issue with this idea of making happiness the goal of life, and especially with any kind of happiness or goal of life that's associated with pleasure and with comfort. So, the question is why? What's his problem with this? Well, he's got lots. But let's start with this focus on pleasure or joy first. So, in his work, will to power. He says this. He says, we don't strive for joy. No. Joy accompanies. Joy does not move. So um, what does he mean by this? Well, I think that what he means is something along the lines that joy or pleasure or happiness is a side effect of doing some activity that's intrinsically interesting or valuable. So Pleasure is not motivating us. It's not moving us. Rather, it's whatever activity that we're engaged in that's doing that. The pleasure that we happen to get from this is just a kind of byproduct of doing that activity and not the goal itself. So what's really going on here then? Well, it's that according to Nietzsche, for many of us, pleasure is not our true end. No. What we're really interested in and moved by is something like meaning. In other words, we do things not because we want to be happy or because we want to um, feel pleasure, but because we think it's meaningful. I mean, I don't know, uh, think of the rock climber Alex Hanold climbing El Capitan. Did he really do this absurdly difficult thing just to be happy? Was that his goal? If all he really wanted was just pleasure or happiness, would he have done what he did? No, I don't think so. Rather, what he did is he chose to pursue meaning or a goal and not good feelings, even though, of course, felicitous good feelings eventually followed as a result of him doing that. And actually, this is exactly what Nietzsche's Zarathustra counsels. He calls out, Do I strive after my happiness? No, I strive after my works. Okay, now, despite what Nietzsche says about happiness, I still actually think that he believed in a, well, let's say that he believed in a kind of different version of it. A, a much deeper, 
more substantial one. That's to say, I think that he believed in a kind of happiness that's inseparable from meaning and from suffering, and so one that's far less uh, contingent on good feelings. Actually, one that's in some ways close to Aristotle's conception of happiness. You see, for Aristotle, happiness wasn't a passive thing. It wasn't something that was uh, given to you. It wasn't about just receiving certain uh, positive mental states. In other words, it wasn't about how you simply felt. For him, you, you couldn't just sit on the couch all day and uh, eat snacks and call yourself happy. No, happiness was about something that you did. It was about acting and being engaged in the world, and it was about living a complete and a rich and a robust life. Well, to the extent that Nietzsche adheres to a conception of happiness, I think it shares some of what Aristotle talks about here. But, like I mentioned, I think Nietzsche leans even harder on meaning and suffering in his particular view of happiness. For him, to center your life around pleasure or good feeling, to be a hedonist, is shallow. And it makes you and your life small and anemic and mediocre and even uh, pointless. Suffice it to say, these are not the sorts of adjectives that best fit Nietzsche's view of happiness or the, or the good life in general for him. Actually, you know what? Nietzsche does provide a definition of happiness. He says this, he says, happiness is a feeling that a resistance has been overcome. Now, um, that's pretty suggestive. What resistance here implies is that is that you have ideals or aims in your life that are large or difficult. Or uh, to put it another way, what resistance implies is the necessity of suffering for the achievement of great goals. In a way, you could say that your level of suffering is a testament to the strength of your goals and your overall engagement with the world. Or uh, to put it the opposite way, Little or no suffering is a good indication of an apathetic life. Anyway, hopefully we see here now how happiness and meaning and suffering are all interconnected for him. So happiness is no small thing for Nietzsche. It involves confronting problems and overcoming challenges and gaining in, uh, in vigorously fought victories but all the while keeping your eye on the ball, that is to say, on the highest of ideals. Oh, you know, I wanted to add one more thing here. I wanted to say that despite the impression I've just given, I don't think that Nietzsche excludes pleasure from a happy and from a meaningful life altogether. It's just that for him, pleasure doesn't come without pain. The overcoming of pain, in fact. And um, that's interesting. It's interesting because what it means is that if you want to have as much pleasure as possible, you need to have as much pain as possible. The price of the greatest pleasure is the greatest displeasure. But, but that kind of pleasure for Nietzsche is always, always worth it. Way better than getting the kind of small pleasure that comes with as little displeasure as possible. No, leave that kind of thing to the mediocre, or as, uh, as Nietzsche calls him, the last man. And that is for another episode. Bye for now.